Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. We are heading into the giving season when we're prompted to think more about giving back and giving to others who are less fortunate than we are. But there are lots of people who've dedicated their lives to the mission of helping others all the time. I had a window into this world during my time working at the American Red Cross and at Mercy Corps, a global humanitarian and development organization, and it's an incredibly meaningful and fulfilling way to spend your days. My next guest has been doing that his whole career and doing it in a very big and creative way. So grab your mug and take a chug because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And before I introduce my guest, one quick request to ask of you. If you haven't already signed up for the Java Junkies Journal, that's the weekly newsletter that all Java Junkies can get to get a sneak peek on that week's upcoming episodes, please head on over to the Time for Coffee website. That's time, the number four, coffee.org. Thanks so much. And my guest today is Dennis Whittle, who co-founded and leads Feedback Labs, which is all about trying to change the norms in development, aid, and philanthropic policy to be more responsive to the people that those policies are trying to help. Dennis has worked for over 30 years in international aid and philanthropy. He is also a co-founder of Global Giving, the first global crowdfunding website where he was CEO from 2000 to 2010. And before that, he was an economist at the World Bank. Bank, where he worked for 14 years in Southeast Asia, in Russia, in Papua New Guinea, and Niger, working on agriculture, housing reform, energy efficiency, structural adjustment, and innovation, all things he puts to great use today. Dennis, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I'm ready. I've got a coffee right in front of me, and I'm halfway through. Awesome. So Dennis, before we started, you were describing yourself to me in your current role at Feedback Labs as the grand poobah. You know, you're the big cheese, the CEO. I'm guessing you got a lot going on on the average day. One of the things, Andrea, about doing a startup is that you do everything from washing the dishes to uh, giving speeches. And so uh, that's why I call myself Grand Poobah, my my staff would my small staff would laugh at me and uh, tell me to hurry up and empty the trash cans. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things for your listeners to know is that it's really exciting to do new things, but you have to be very flexible. You can't have a great sense of status uh, for yourself. You can't have a lot of ego. You got to do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's what Grand Poobahs uh, really do. So what are the various functions and responsibilities of the Grand Poobah at Feedback Labs beyond washing dishes and emptying trash cans? Andrea, the most important job of of the Grand Poobah is to be the curator of the vision and the main ideas. And so for Feedback Labs, that's really a very simple idea, which is we ought to ask people themselves what they need to make their lives better and whether we're helping them get it. And if not, what we should do differently. So that my number one job is just to keep people's eyes and ears on those topics. And so take me into a typical day. What kinds of things are you juggling in order to keep your team with their eyes on the prize? Well, this morning, uh, I started my morning with a call from a, a German government official who wants to host a summit in Berlin of all the international aid organizations to help them think about how they can do things dramatically different, maybe create a new operating system for aid in the same way that we have Microsoft Windows and Apple OS X. Maybe we should work together as aid agencies to create a new operating system that brings us into the modern age. So I start off with that and talking to him about the people we might have from Africa uh, and Europe and the United States who would be able to think at that architectural level and have the influence to change the big organizations. And then after that call, I ran into a meeting with my team here that is planning our upcoming summit next week where we bring together 150 leaders uh, in feedback 
across the philanthropy and aid space. So in that meeting, we're talking what kind of coffee we're going to have and what we're going, to, how the tables are going to be arranged at the dinner and how the panels are going to be set up. And we talk about financial issues and what the lighting will be and how to avoid snafus with the Wi-Fi and a lot of nitty gritty details. And then after this call, I will be back on the phone with a large international funder helping them develop a guidebook for how to listen and respond better to the people that they seek to serve. So even in one morning, as you could see, it spans the highly conceptual to the quality of the coffee that you're going to, we're going to be serving at our summit. Dennis, clearly you're somebody who would fall into the category of being a serial entrepreneur. What is it about being in a startup that you're finding to be so attractive that you would leave comfortable and secure positions in other organizations that you've actually started? Well, I'll start with World Bank first and organizations that I didn't start. One thing I noticed after working in places like the World Bank for so long is everyone knows that there are many problems and that we should do things differently. But it really struck me that not that many people will actually try to do things differently. So my story began, you know, in the World Bank where I was like, well, why don't we just try different things? And people responded very well to this. So I became a kind of entrepreneur inside the World Bank in the late 90s just by being willing to lead my teams on things that hadn't been done inside the World Bank before. That experience led me and a colleague to resign from the World Bank and create Global Giving, as you said, the first global crowdfunding website. We did that because somebody we had worked with at the World Bank said that she thought there ought to be something like that. And we agreed with her, and but it was clear nobody was going to do it. So we decided to do it. And it seemed like a crazy idea. Uh, we weren't sure whether it made sense or not, but we did it. And it ended up working after a ton of blood, sweat and tears. I was CEO of that for 10 years. And in the same way that we all rise to the level or make the contribution we can make at a certain time after 10 years, I thought it's time for me to move on to allow fresh blood, in this case, my co-founder, to take over completely and re-energize the organization. And I decided to go off and do something related. I did some ideas that I had gotten while I was at Global Giving, but a little bit distinct. And that's what became Feedback Labs. And how are Feedback Labs actually kind of squaring the circle, getting the kind of responses, the kind of input from the communities that various nonprofits are serving and and working that into the programmatic functions of these organizations. So Feedback Labs is a network of 400 plus organizations around the world that are experimenting with this. So we convene meetings among our network practically every week where one organization will come in and say, hey, I'm trying something that I want everybody else to know about. I need your help in making it successful. So a group might be trying to, for example, listen to families in rural Uganda uh, about what they need for their children to thrive and grow up uh, and be educated better. And this group might be using text messages. Now, text, uh, text messaging is quite common all around the world and collecting ideas and responses from young mothers. And they want help on how to analyze them, how to uh, reflect those responses back to the young mothers and discuss it with the young mothers, which sometimes they'll do electronically by phone, but more often in group meetings. And then the big challenge, as you alluded to, is how do you decide to do things differently within your own organization and make those decisions and modify your programs? So we have done about 90 to 100 of these convenings where organizations in our network talk about how they're experimenting with collecting the information, analyzing the feedback, discussing the feedback with the people they collected it from, and then closing the loop by doing things differently. And sometimes that's done in a high tech way. In other cases, it's done literally with a pen and paper or pencil and paper. The method doesn't matter as much as the mindset. Something that was really enlightening for me when I worked at Mercy Corps in particular, Dennis, was the fact that, and if you're not in this world, it may seem counterintuitive, but that the people in organizations, for example, in the US that are working internationally are not the ones with the answers and the solutions. Can you elaborate on that? One of the 
sort of defining principles of the way things seem to work nowadays is the idea that big organizations, big aid agencies, big foundations try to hire the smartest people they can find, people like you. Occasionally, they make a mistake and hire somebody like me. But the idea is that the smart people are trying are supposed to go out into the world and diagnose the world's problems and then come up with solutions to the problems. In fact, we know, and you know, if there's one thing our experience over the last 50 years shows, it's that we in the North, in the rich countries, can't really know what people need to make their lives better. We might have some ideas and we might have some insights into how they can get it. But the what that people need is really got to come from them. And so the big challenge is to invert the way we operate. So we lead with listening. And many aid organizations now are trying to figure out ways to lead with their ears instead of their mouths. And this is a very fundamental transition that they have to make. Very interesting experiments are starting. It's going to take a long time. It'll run into a lot of resistance. But the transition is underway. Where do you see the biggest bottlenecks right now to making this happen at scale? There are two or three bottlenecks that we are working on in our network at at Feedback Labs. The first is just the idea and the idea that you should listen to people. This seems very simple, but many of us haven't thought about it. So how do you kind of get a general acceptance of this idea that you should start with what people want? Some people react to that in a kind of ethical and moral way. Well, of course, it's the right thing to do to listen to people. That's just what we should do. It's ethical. Other people want to know the empirical evidence for that. Well, does it result in better outcomes? So we work at Feedback Labs on both of those things, on kind of the moral and ethical side of the equation, and on the research and empirical side, which does incidentally show substantially better results if you start with listening. Once you have those two tracks down, then you need to think about the nuts and bolts of changing large institutions. And a lot of that has to do with not only expectations of what your what people's jobs are, kind of the kind of sociology inside institutions, but also things like procurement and evaluation. Right now, most organizations try to design big projects in advance so that they can create procurement processes. And procurement, for your listeners, all that means is how you buy stuff. Most big organizations have elaborate processes and procurements for how you buy things. And it has to be pre-specified ahead of time. Procurement, people inside organizations to make those processes more flexible so you don't have to determine ahead of time what you're going to do. You can start a project, listen, adapt and refine what you do as you go and have that be a sign of success rather than a sign of, of failure, which it has been in the past. The other side is monitoring and evaluation. And many Many projects get evaluated on their original design and on their original goals. But increasingly, people are trying to become more flexible and adapt their goals and adapt the design as they go. So you don't want to have an evaluation process process that penalizes you for changing what your goals are in response to what people tell you they want. So those are what I call the nuts and bolts side. So there's the idea side, what's right. There's the empirical side, which is what has an impact. And then there's nuts and bolts, which is procurement and evaluation. So Dennis, for Java junkies who are still in school. I was hearing all kinds of ideas in my head when you were talking with regards to what they could or should be studying right now to help prepare them for this new world, hopefully, that we'll be seeing within the international development aid slash philanthropy space. What do you think those classes would be that they should be taking now to get them ahead of the curve? That's a great question, Andrea. I kind of wish I could go back to school and either read or reread some key things that I think are, are foundational. One part of that is philosophy, basic philosophy or political philosophy, ranging from you know Adam Smith and to Tocqueville. Adam Smith, we always think of him as the hidden hand uh, in economics, but he talks a ton about what matters to people in terms of their self-esteem and their identity. And it's very profound uh, about uh, human nature. De Tocqueville wrote about more how how groups form within society and what matters to them, voluntary associations of people all the way up to government. And he came to the United States in the early days and looked at that really, really, really interesting stuff that's very relevant to aid and philanthropy, which we're increasingly appreciating has to do not just with does somebody have food on the table, but do they have a sense of belonging, self-esteem, identity? 
these disciplines, these perspectives, these issues are highly underappreciated in our field. I think being able to understand issues related to identity, community, belonging, and self-esteem will be key for the leaders in philanthropy and aid in the years ahead. So I would definitely read and study things related to philosophy, sociology, a political organization. The second cluster of things I would study are quantitative disciplines, statistics, biostatistics, econometrics. You need to apply these tools to have a seat at the table at the leadership level in these organizations. You need to be able to understand and at least be a critical consumer of all of the experimental and research work that's going on with respect to how different types of programs improve welfare or different policies improve people's lives. So that's been a very important part of my life over the last 30 years is being able to be a competent consumer of those things, of, of, of studies, empirical studies. The third thing that I would say is organizational behavior, which sounds like the most boring topic in the world. And I'll be honest, Andrew, I didn't even understand what that meant when I was in school. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think as you realize, you know, as you have more experience, you start to think about organizations as organisms. And to try to change an organization is a very complex and difficult task. And I've been lucky enough over the last 20 years or so to be involved in a lot of reform efforts within big organizations. And it's increased my respect and interest in learning how organizations work what makes them tick, what makes leaders tick, what makes your colleagues tick. And so that's kind of organizational awareness and understanding of organizations. That's more and more important. The higher you rise the, uh, as a leader, the more and more important it is for you to understand how that works. Great. Thanks. That's really helpful. Dennis, you mentioned that you were a religion major in the espresso shots, but I didn't hear you say where you went to school. Andrew, I was lucky enough to get a Moorhead scholarship to go to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I was trying to decide what to major in. And I had family pressure to become a lawyer and to study the normal things like economics and political science. But one day I walked into a a philosophy of religion class and the professor Peter Kaufman was truly outstanding and I decided what the heck I will do something different I will major in religious studies to just try something different so when you were at UNC Chapel Hill studying religion as an undergrad did you know what you were gonna do with that degree when you graduated I had no idea and a lot of people Andrea, when they hear an introduction of me, when thank you for your kind introduction, it looks to people like I had a very planned out career. I'll be honest with you. I assumed I would probably be a lawyer, a corporate lawyer, and live a kind of unremarkable uh, and unrisky life. I had some rough times growing up. My parents were divorced, and I wanted stability above all in my life. And I assumed that that's what I would do. And somehow through a series of being willing to try new things, I kind of got off on this track that's led me through what you described in your introduction all the way to talking to you today. Each step has been an incremental one. And I think what the common thread is, is just been willing to try to do what makes sense and try to make the world a better place. Well, thank goodness for people like you, Dennis. That's all I can say. And before I get a little bit more into your professional life, I want to ask you about your time as an undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill and whether there were any extracurriculars, any clubs, any fraternities, any internships that you had while you were in college that after you graduated, you look back on and said, wow, holy cow, I am so glad that I had those experiences because they're helping me now in my professional life? That's a great question, Andrea. I was a little bit of a rebel, so I didn't want to be part of too many student activities. I didn't consider myself a do-gooder. And in fact, I still don't consider myself a do-gooder. So I didn't join a lot of student clubs. Uh, I was in student government a little bit, but that's not where my heart was. Instead, I worked at a lot of different jobs, uh, including in the summer. And some of them were very highfalutin, 
Uh, for example, I worked for a pharmaceutical company in their strategic planning division uh, one summer in California. But many of them were, I was a busboy at the Porthole restaurant where I got a ton of amazingly important experience uh, about people and customer service and later in life. I went on an outward bound course, which had a remarkable, profound effect on me, on the way I relate to myself and nature and other people and the physical aspect of taking risks in life. So I had many, I had a great range of experiences. And I think it's that range of experiences from outward bound to being a busboy to working in a pharmaceutical strategic planning division that was really important to me. I think if I had just done one type of thing, it would not have been as valuable. Which outward bound did you do? I actually did Hurricane Island and I would agree it had a profound effect, positive on my life as well. Yeah, I did the uh, Pecos and the Bandelier in New Mexico. Uh, so for three weeks, uh, a combination of rafting, uh, rock climbing, and ice camping. Oh, man. Uh, and I hadn't done any of those before. And it was great. It was great. Yeah, we were rowing on these huge wooden sailboats. And I say rowing because I was in Maine in the summer and there happened to be no wind for much of the time we were out there on the water. So we were rowing with 18-foot oars. <laughs> it was tough and rock climbing and running every morning at 6 a.m. and then jumping off a 20-foot pier into the freezing cold water. And for any Java junkies who aren't familiar with Outward Bound, the philosophy is that if one person in your group doesn't complete an activity, then the rest of you don't whatever. Fill in the blank if it's have breakfast, have lunch, have dinner. So there's a lot of reason to get everyone in the group to complete your activities. One thing I, one reason I think that's so important for listeners today is a lot of what we do is in the digital realm. We spend our whole days looking at our computer or listening to podcasts or uh, in the digital world. And things like Outward Bound are intensely analog. And they just use different parts of your brain, of your body, of your being. And I urge all listeners, even if you graduated from college, go out and do that stuff while you can. It gets harder to do as you get older. Yeah, absolutely. Dennis, when you graduated from UNC, do you remember what your first job was and how you got it? I went directly to graduate. No, I took it back. <laughs> this is a good story. Can we talk about this on air? I don't know. Maybe we can. My girlfriend was going to Europe to study. And I wanted to be in Europe with her. So I had to figure out what to do. This is actually a great lesson for life. I got a job as a tour guide for a high school group going out of Atlanta to Europe for the summer. So I traveled around Europe as the tour guide for a bunch of high school kids. And I remember this because we went to a bunch of cities that I had never been to before. And I had to pretend like I had been there <laughs> and give them a tour of the city. Um, <laughs> so that's a, that's kind of a, in some ways, that's a little bit of a, uh, that was a little preview of my life to come because you do have to, I remember one of my friends said, Dennis, how can you apply for that job? You've never, you know, you, you, you've studied in Europe, but you don't have never been to a lot of those cities. And I was like, well, I'll figure it out. And guess what? I did figure it out. And the kids had a great time and I had a great time and, uh, I kind of faked it till I made it. And a lot of startup work is you got to fake it till you make it. Um, and you don't want to do things that are ridiculous or irresponsible. But in that case, the kids had a good time. They were safe. I had a good time. A little stressful. <laughs> but, but it worked out. It's great. So I hadn't thought about that. I'm glad you asked that question. Dennis, I also hear another theme that has been running through your life. And I wonder if you would share with Java junkies how important it is to have a high tolerance for risk. Andrea, that is interesting because I didn't start out that way. I didn't start out embracing risk. As I said, my childhood was a little bit tumultuous because of a breakdown in my family. And I grew up in not ultra poor, I don't want to exaggerate, but in straightened circumstances. And I, I didn't want to take risk. I, I wanted stability. And yet something kept drawing me to just trying little things. And uh, I guess somehow I don't know why I was drawn to this and why I keep coming back to it. But 
I guess the reason is a lot of the things that I talk about that may seem risky to other people, they don't appear risky to me at the time. They appear like, well, got to try it. And it's a strange, I don't think of myself as a thrill seeker. I think of myself as a, I don't know, do what makes sense or do what's interesting seeker. Do you think that that is a formula for professional fulfillment for Java junkies? I would say everybody can and should do that. And what your threshold is in terms of trying new things is up to each individual person. But if I can do what I've been doing based on a moderate level of risk, then almost anybody can lead a more interesting life by just embracing that philosophy, I think. If in doubt, do what's interesting. If in doubt, do what makes sense. If in doubt, do what would help lead other people toward what they say should be done. It doesn't have to be a giant step. It doesn't always have to be bold. It can just be a modest step in that direction. And I perceive my life as a series of mostly modest steps punctuated occasionally by founding something like Global Giving or Feedback Labs. But the vast majority of things have just been modest steps day to day. Do what makes sense. Do what's interesting. Dennis, I try to ask all my guests on Time for Coffee to share a story with Java junkies about a time in their professional life when they really struggled, whether they had a jerk for a boss or colleagues who weren't collegial or were in over their head and struggling. Have you had an experience like that? And would you be kind enough to share it with our listeners? One of the things that you don't see on my resume is long, flat periods of excruciating boredom. And there have been times in my exciting career where nothing's really interesting has been happening. And so that's number one. You do have to go through long periods of gestation or boredom or working with pe- uninteresting people on uninteresting things to get to the peaks, I think. And so my number one message is don't be discouraged by that. That's normal. I've had a ton of complete idiots that I've worked with, bosses who were totally unreasonable. Uh, I worked as an, I was a, I worked at an ice cream store once uh, and uh, got into a huge fight with my boss because he was making unreasonable demands on my colleagues. And I took up for them and we got into a, to a big fight and I, you know, uh, stormed out. So there's There's plenty of times and plenty of idiots out there, and that's just a fact of life. The key is to get away from them as quickly as you can. Sometimes it takes a while. And find the people that are interesting and find the people with whom you can be productive and have fun. But you will always run across venal idiots. It's just a fact of life. (laughs) I love it. Venal idiots. (laughs) You don't get you don't get much more plain speaking than that. (laughs) Some people are just idiots and some people are venal, but not idiots. And then some people are (laughs) venal idiots. (laughs) Dennis, final time for coffee question here. If you could go back to UNC Chapel Hill and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom that you have now. What advice would you give yourself? I think the number one thing I wish I could go back and do would be to absorb the things I learned as something valuable in and of themselves. The books I read for purely instrumental reasons back then in order to be able to write the paper or do the exam, I would spend more time reading and absorbing and thinking about and talking to people about for completely non-instrumental reasons. I saw school at that time as something I had to do well in and get through in order to to succeed in life, in order to get a good job that would be stable, that would make my future affluent enough so that I wouldn't be poor and I wouldn't suffer from uh, from being poor status-wise, etc. If I could go back, I would spend those four years just bathing in the substance of what I was learning and in the richness of it. I would read the books for the sake of what's in them, not for the sake of the exam or the paper. I would spend a lot more time talking to my friends about the ideas and about what they implied for life. I would have spent much more time just enjoying the inherent beauty of learning. And that would have served me better both as a person while I was there and also better in my future life. A lot of those books I'm rereading now just read Proust last year and I loved it. And I wished I had read it earlier or I wish I had absorbed it earlier. And there are many, many things like that that I wish I had had absorbed back then. But there's still time to do it now. 
Absolutely. Dennis, thank you so much for making Time for Coffee with me and the Time for Coffee community. I learned a tremendous amount by listening to you, and I know our Java junkies will as well. It's been a real pleasure for me, Andrea. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.